Welcome to Leadership Reimagined, where game-changing conversations are reshaping the world of work. I'm Janice Elleg, the CEO and founder of Elleg Group, Executive Search Advisors, where we are reimagining search through our longstanding commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. On today's topic, culture, tech, and the future, a CEO's sweet spot, I am delighted to welcome Julie Sweet, Chair and Chief Executive Officer of Accenture the world's largest professional services firm with over 700,000 employees globally and revenues of over 50 billion. Julie began her career at Accenture as general counsel, corporate secretary, and chief compliance officer, and was promoted to be CEO of Accenture North America and in 2019 to CEO and chair in 2021. Prior to Accenture, Julie was a partner at the law firm Cravath, Swain, and more. Julie serves on the World Economic Forum Board of Trustees. Additionally, Julie is board chair of Catalyst and serves on the board of trustees for the Center for Strategic and International Studies and for the Marriott family established nonprofit Bridges from School to Work. With many recognitions, Julie has repeatedly been named as one of Fortune's most powerful women in business and Forbes' 100 most powerful women in the world. Julie, I am delighted to have you join us today and take time out of your very busy schedule. So thank you. Thanks, Janice. I appreciate being here today. Well, I've known you for years and watched you ascend into the CEO seat that you hold today. And you're only one of 44 Fortune 500 women CEOs. Also, when you were at Cravath, Swain & Moore, you were the ninth woman partner in the history of the firm, which dates back to 1841. And the year 1999, you were the only woman to make partner that year. I know you said in your upbringing, your parents said, if you work hard, you will succeed. What has been your drive? How have you gotten to be in this rarefied group of women CEOs? I didn't start off saying I wanted to become a CEO. It certainly hasn't been a straight line. When I really think about what drives me, you know, there's this plaque that my husband hung in our mudroom. It really encapsulates, I think, something about my career. The plaque says, if your dreams don't scare you, they're not big enough. And, you know, when I look back on my career, I made a number of choices over the time because I didn't feel like I was dreaming big enough or that I had, you know, that like I could see what was going to happen. So for example, I came to Accenture, not because I didn't love my job as a partner at Cravath, but because when I got the call from Accenture, I could look out and I could say, I know my future. I know what I'm going to do if I stay at Cravath. And, you know, this allows me to dream bigger, right? To have that scarier feeling, right? Of, of I don't know exactly how it's going to turn out. And, uh, and I think that's really important because it's not so much about what's the line to being a CEO woman or not, but really what is challenging you, what you know makes you excited, what gets you out of your comfort zone. And I don't think of it as just taking risks because you know who, who wants to have their career be about taking risks? Like that's not inspiring to me. Dreaming big, that's inspiring. And you have dreamed big, but also impacted the lives of others in doing so. You pulled other women along. Let me ask also about that upbringing in terms of You spent time in China. You speak Mandarin. What took you down that path? That's a great story, Janice, and one that I think a lot about when I'm attending dinners and if I have a young person sitting next to me, because I actually started down the path of studying Chinese because of a specific individual. I was a high school senior. I'd been granted a scholarship from the Irvine Company in Orange County. And I went to the awards dinner and I sat next to a man um, named Howard Margolius, who was on the board of the Irvine Company. And it turns out the board of my uh, college, board of trustees of the college I was about to go to. And he asked me a very simple question. He said, what are you going to study in college? You know, the, the normal question. And I said, international relations. And he said, what language? And I said, well, I studied French in high school, but I think it's kind of boring. And he said, literally, three words that changed my life. He said, how about Chinese? Now, back then, this was in 1985. If someone in California where I grew up was, you know, going outside, they're mostly going to Europe. If they were going to study any Asian language, it was Japan. No one was talking about China then. Uh, And he happened to have an export import business, do a lot about China. We had a fascinating conversation. I went home that night to my parents, who, by the way, didn't have a passport. And I said, 
I am going to study Chinese and I'm going to go live in Taiwan and China for a year. And they sort of said, okay, honey, whatever you'd like to do. And that really brought me to studying that. But, but more than the language, right, it was really an adventure and to go into a place that other people weren't going into and to go and succeed in a very different environment. And it taught me a lot of skills and it also fed my desire to dream big. Well, your parents must have been very excited to see you go off and then come back and, and the career that you've had. And as the mother of two girls, do you hope for a future where, you know, we won't just have 44 women in the CEO ranks of the Fortune 500? And do you see boards, you know, now looking more to put women and raise them up into higher levels and that the opportunities are there? I hope that in my lifetime, uh, I'm only 54, I hope in my lifetime, I will see a time where we don't have to talk about women CEOs or, you know, African-American CEOs because we reach a scale and it becomes natural that you don't have to have, you know, separate lists because it's so unusual. And, you know, and, and that is, of course, the kind of world that I hope for, not only for my daughters, but really, you know, for all kids today. And I think there's, you know, every generation brings with it a different um you know, a different perspective. I look at the generation of my children and I think diversity of all kinds, uh, you know, whether it's LGBTQ, uh, racial, gender, uh, they're much more at ease. Uh, now that may be where I live, uh, you know, it may not be ubiquitous, but I, I do think that there are generational changes that I hope will be a part of us getting to that point. Yes. And you are a trailblazer in this arena in many ways, including gender equality in the workplace at Accenture. And you're committed to getting to that gender equality level by 2025 with over 700,000 employees. How, how will you hit this target? How will you make that change at Accenture? You know, Janice, I, I actually think that there's a lot of basics that we started with and that every company can start with that are not magic. The first basic is deciding it's a business priority. Back in 2013, when we were looking at a business that was less than 20% digital cloud and security in a world where we had just said every business would be a digital business, we had a business priority to change our culture, to become innovation led, and we knew we needed to be more diverse. Second business basic, you set goals and then you have accountable executives in plans underneath them, just as you do your revenue goals. And then you look at all the building blocks. One of the things that drives me crazy is when you know people say it's gonna take them years to get to equal pay. Like I have no idea why that would take years. Like you absolutely should not pay people doing the same job differently based on any kind of diversity. And I'm not talking about, yes, it's, you know, you, you look at things differently, like, you know, how many years of experience, but if you just say apples to apples, of course you have to pay them the same. That shouldn't take years. And, you know, our research still shows that many, many companies don't have the um, systems and the data in place to actually even know whether or not they have equal pay. When people talk to me ha about how it's you know hard to reach diversity targets, I always start with the basics. Is it a priority? Do you set goals? Do you have the data? Do you have the basic foundational elements in place that aren't hard? because right? none of those things are hard. Then how you do it can be hard, and there's a lot of work that you've got to do, but much of it has been pioneered that you don't even have to reinvent it. We think that our success over the last decade, and we've been a very successful company, we've grown at a 10% CAGR, uh, we are a leader in sustainability, a leader in diversity. Uh, we hired in the last 18 months in the tightest labor market in history, 200,000 people. So in many, many dimensions of how you think about success, not only financial success, which we clearly have, we believe that our commitment to diversity and the fact that we are diverse is inseparable from other elements that have helped us be successful. Julie, you're so intentional. 
And I think that in that in the focus and with the data behind you and make it a business imperative, the hard part may be some of the implementation, but if you know where you're going and you're making it happen, so you are a model for others to follow. You mentioned in the last 18 months, you've hired over 200,000 new employees. That's incredible to assimilate that many into your organization. And I understand the term or expression is used as digital, which is combining the physical and the digital when onboarding new employees. And you also train them in the metaverse. So how has this positively impacted employees, your culture, and your clients with how you're onboarding your enormous number of new people, 200,000? Well, Janice, the way I think about this is what does it mean to be an innovation-led company? And innovation is not only about products and services, it's about how you run yourself. So one of our leadership essentials is actually that we need leaders who are innovation-led. And when you think about the pandemic, when you could no longer physically meet to onboard employees, many companies simply you know, sort of moved on to teams, right? And you just did it in, in that way. And of course, all of us did that in the first few weeks because that was the only alternative. But we were actually already pretty remote, but we, we as well always did some portion of that onboarding physically in an office. And so we actually took um, a small team and took a step back and said, how do we innovate? How do we make this move to onboarding, not just, you know, sort of it it works, right? Sort of satisfy the needs, but actually enhances the onboarding experience. And then we also took a deep look at what is different, right? And so that really led to, in the first case saying, we need to have a new kind of experience in onboarding. And that's why we built one Accenture Park, which is the largest enterprise metaverse we believe in the world, where as a part of onboarding, you actually go to our metaverse, which is one Accenture Park. It's where you experience our business. You get to experience our TQ training. You do it with others. So you now have a bonding experience, just like you might've had a team building experience in person. And the science says that immersive learning, you retain longer. So we're getting, you know, better onboarding. We're building an experience. We're building connections. And oh, by the way, if you want, you know, your employees to be innovation led, you can't imagine the impact of like getting to join a company and have part of it be in the metaverse. Like it really feels innovative. So that was about really improving, enhancing, and you know, doing something you know, really, really new that you actually couldn't achieve in the old way, even if we could go to the office. Fidgetal is slightly different. Fidgetal is understanding the new world and to say, when someone went to an office, they did have a physical attachment. And so we had people kind of shutting their computers from one company and sort of opening up our computers with no attachment or, you know, sometimes just sitting in the same place. And so what we we started doing now for all of our new hires is we send them a box and it does have the laptop in it. It's recyclable, by the way, the box, but it also has you know, swag from Accenture. It has little posters that would be like the kind of poster you'd see if you were actually walking in the door on your first day to go to your onboarding, like around our commitment to sustainability and our leadership essentials. And so that physically their workspace has changed and built a connection from day one with Accenture that's not simply we handed you a laptop. And I think those are principles that you can apply in every aspect of your business. Uh, and, you know, for many companies who are transforming, you know, starting with the person and the experience or the customer and the experience and then working backwards. Yeah, so this does carry over to belonging to Accenture. And of course, they then belong to the client. You're really bringing them on board to be better employees for all of your clients. And it's amazing with 700,000 that you have globally, you have these eight leadership essentials. What are they and how does that distinguish Accenture? Well, let me tell you a story. When I first became CEO on September 1st, 2019, at the time, I knew that I was going to be putting in one of the biggest operating model changes in our history. So I knew a lot of change was coming. I didn't know a pandemic was coming six months later, I have to say. And I did a lot of reflection on you know, the future because we were at an inflection point. Our strategy to rotate to digital cloud and security had been successful. It was in its last year. Change 
And reinvention always starts with leadership behaviors. And so in my very first month working with my global management committee at the time, I put out our leadership essentials and I used the opportunity of a new CEO and that to, to talk about what leadership means. And those leadership essentials were created in very plain language, really to kind of be the guidepost, because especially at our scale, you can't change by direction. Like people have to understand what's the values. So let me give you a, a few examples of those essentials. You know, one, of course, is do the right thing. And that is absolutely core. But my second leadership essential is lead with excellence, confidence, and humility. And humility is really important because leaders with humility are learners. They don't feel like everything needs to be built by them, right? So the sort of build versus buy that you have a lot of people, oh, I have to build it myself. They're willing to look outside. They partner. They build great teams. And you know, I knew that as we moved forward with the pace of change, with the importance of our ecosystem partners and the more and more complex business is that I needed to underscore that all of my leaders needed to be learners. They needed to have that humility. They needed to be externally focused, not always internally focused. And that carries through, you know, with what we do at my global management committee meetings, for example, we do a lot of learning. I mean, my basic rule is if I need to learn it, then I can't imagine that my entire global management committee doesn't need to learn it. And so the leadership essentials really get to the core of what do you think you need to have in terms of the kinds of leaders, not just for the program you're driving today, you know, but you know, as you look out in the longer term. And, and I think it's really important because oftentimes I find clients can't articulate that uh, or their leadership, you know, everybody has leadership principles, but they're old and they haven't been thought about in the context of the environment, the strategy, and, you know, what's there for the future. I've heard you speak about intellectual curiosity, being comfortable with ambiguity, being a good communicator. Are these some of the qualities you look for when you're hiring leaders? Our number one quality is, are they going to be learners? And we ask a very simple question. If it's to a college kid, we say other than in school, but we basically say, what have you learned in the last six months? And we don't care if the answer is, I learned how to make paella right? I learned to ski, right? Uh, or I learned a new, you know, I got a new certificate in, you know, another kind of technology. The point is, we believe that learning agility is absolutely critical for our workforce today. If you think about the pandemic, in the first six months after the pandemic, we trained 100,000 people in skills that were in much more demand. So cloud exploded, the need for collaboration tools like Teams uh, exploded, and we needed more people who could, you know, work with clients on those skills. And and so at any given time, you know, we are asking and needing our people to be skilled. We spend a billion dollars a year on uh, training and development, uh, and so. I think that that's important, not just for an Accenture, you know, we're all about change and we're constantly, you know, learning new things for our clients. I think that's true in all clients today because the life expectation of skills is much shorter today. So something like 30% of skills in 2017 on the Fortune 500 uh, companies are like no longer relevant today. And so you really need a workforce that is able to learn and has a thirst for learning. And it doesn't have to be that complicated, uh, as you can see from the way we do it, uh, in terms of sort of getting at, am I hiring someone who's a learner? So the agility is really important here. And you have so many programs going on. Like you say, you're investing a billion a year. That's enormous. What are you advising your clients to do with regard to workplace, maybe is all virtual or a hybrid? How do you advise your clients to get the most out of their employees? Three weeks ago, I had my top 800 leaders at Accenture together for the first time. And I will tell you that for the three days that we were together, I did not have one topic about return to work or virtual or not. Well, I think a lot of people are focused on that topic. You know, we sort of think about talent differently. So we believe over the next decade, the companies who are able to do three things around talent are going to be the ones that succeed. 
The first is their ability to access talent, which requires you to have the ability to attract diverse talent, to look at you know more broadly talent. So for example, not limiting yourself to four-year degrees so you can have larger pools. So access talent. The second is the ability to become a talent creator, not just a consumer. So when you need new skills, the answer can't always be, I'm going to go hire the skills, uh, as I just talked about because the skill changes are needed and your business needs is, you know, how do you do it? And that may require you to partner. Not everybody has a learning organization like I do, but really thinking about how do you become a talent creator? And then the third is how do you unlock the potential of that talent? And that's everything from how you operate. What's your operating model? A lot of companies live today still in silos, which does not allow you to unlock the potential of the great talent that you're either hiring or creating. It's also, though, what's your philosophy? So at Accenture, we have a very clear framework where we say we want our people to feel they are net better off because they work at Accenture. And that has the dimensions of everything from career pathways and financial security to health, to emotional wellness, to a sense of belonging, to knowing you have a purpose. And it really does you know, strategically guide us in how we think about everything from benefits to you know, how we re- rotate people in their careers to how we organize Accenture. If you are you know, a CEO or running a business unit, or you have any kind of a team being able to say to how am I accessing the best talent? How am I a talent creator? And what am I doing to unlock the potential of that great talent that I'm investing in? It's a very simple way of thinking about talent. And I think quite powerful. You do have a way of boiling it down and then forge ahead to make great things happen. Julie, you've been CEO since 2019 chair since 2021, a short period of time, you've accomplished a lot and did this, as you said, the passing of Pierre Nardin, your CEO, the pandemic, you've taken on so much and done so much in a short period of time. What's next on your agenda, on your initiatives for this iconic, complex, huge global consulting firm? Wonderful question and something we ask ourselves all the time because the world no longer exists in, you know, sort of five-year strategies, for example. So you have to maintain a long-term view while at the same time asking yourself what's changing in the environment. And of course, as you know, the environment continues to change. Uh, We thought the pandemic was unprecedented and we're living again in new unprecedented times. And, And so one of the things we did recently is to take a step back because everything we do starts with our clients. And back in 2013, we were the first company to say that every business will be a digital business. And that really shaped a decade of what we did for clients and therefore our own growth. And two years post-pandemic, we took a step back recently to say, what does the next decade look like for our clients? And keeping in mind there's, you know, all of the external macro and geopolitical environment, we really believe there are five forces that successful client companies must harness over the next decade. And those forces are total enterprise reinvention. And so not simply looking at technology to to be part of your company, but really having a complete tech data and AI first and new ways of working, engaging with um, employees and, and customers and new business models. We're seeing that today. The second force is talent, which I talked about unlocking, creating, and accessing talent. The third force is sustainability. Every business must be a sustainable business. The fourth is the metaverse continuums, which is really working both in the physical and digital world seamlessly. And if you haven't seen it, our tech vision this year uh, is a really great plain English description of the metaverse continuum. And then the fifth is the ongoing tech revolution. We were uh, investing a decade ago in the technologies that underline the metaverse. Our cloud business today is a $26 billion business. A decade ago, um, it was a billion dollar business. We had started investing in that, you know, five or six years before that. So we are always looking at sort of a decade out and sitting here today, we have, we're doing science technology. Uh, we actually have a space business. It's super small, but we're doing uh, paid work in space. So as a leader, making sure you understand that the 
tech revolution, both for total enterprise reinvention is continuing, but also into new areas. And, and so we really are pivoting our business around helping our clients harness those five forces in a very industry specific way. It's incredible. You have Accenture Interactive, which is being renamed as Accenture Song. What's the mission of this agency and value to your clients? Well, let me start with what they do so that, that you can relate to it. Right. So if you buy a Jaguar Land Rover, uh, you are having a personalized experience that Accenture is both helping create and run. Uh, and so, you know, Jaguar announced last year that they wanted to uh, provide deeper engagement with their customers. And to do that, you need technology, you need data and insights. And Accenture Song brings all of that together to enable a leading company like Jaguar Land Rover to create a new kind of experience for their customers, a new way of engaging and building loyalty, and therefore also growth. It's interesting, 90% of executives that we recently surveyed have said that they cannot keep up with the changing expectations of customers and employees. And what Accenture Song does is really does everything you need around the customer to remain relevant at what we call the speed of life, which is much faster. Uh, another great example is if you buy pet food. So we worked with a major pet brand that pre-pandemic was all about in-store. So if you went into store, you would buy it there, you'd have these um, in-person advisors. And of course, all of that changed in the pandemic. And so we help them create an online engaging community where pet parents can track the activity of their pets. They can connect with other pet parents. They can connect with advisors that once upon a time they would meet only in the stores. Underneath that, of course, is the technology, you know, the cloud, the data, and then the creativity to how do you interact with those pet parents? What's the experience? What do they uh, need? And so Accenture Song operates at the intersection of creativity, technology, and industry to really do everything that in the B2C or the B2B world a client needs to be relevant to their customer and to be able to change as those customers do. I think everybody listening wants to now be part of Accenture. <laughs> you were so cutting edge and we could go on for hours. But let me ask just any parting words to leaders who want to be leading change going forward in their current organizations, leaders who are in their roles today. What's your advice for the, you know, really being sustainable going forward? What do people need to do? One is around communication. You mentioned this a little bit earlier. Change is about bringing people along a journey. And at Accenture, we believe in transparency and also being able to communicate in a way that people can understand. And that uh, sometimes I, I say simplification is the new innovation, right? And so as an individual leader working on your communication skills, being able to tell stories, to bring things to life, to simplify, but also to have communication that's empathetic, that understands what the person receiving it, that sort of people backwards, client backwards is really important. And I do work literally every year to hone my communication skills. And I think it's absolutely vital. Uh, and whether you're a very junior person or a very senior person, you know, consciously working on communication skills, uh, I think is really important. And then speed doesn't happen unless you change the way you're doing things. And I, I've spoken to a lot of C-suite executives post-pandemic who were rightly very proud of how fast their organizations shifted uh, to adjust to the pandemic. And what I'm seeing two years in is that the organizations that then made systematic changes, in other words, you can't have speed be based on a crisis. That's not sustainable. And what you saw sort of happen is that people say, oh, I can move fast. But then they often didn't say, so what do I have to do to do that outside of it? Do I need to change procurement? Do I need to partner differently? 
Do I need to, you know, change the operating model, which I did, you know, in the heat of the moment in the crisis where I just said that person's in charge and, you know, we're going to cut through the bureaucracy. Did I then go back and say, well, why wouldn't we do that always? And, uh, and so I challenged myself, you know, in the way I run Accenture, you know, in the same way, like, what did I change? So, you know, for example, after the pandemic started, when I set my fiscal year priorities, I don't set them all as 12 month priorities, because we, we're not living in a world where you can run some of your most strategic things on a 12 month cycle, right? And that just reinforces, you know, kind of old thinking and not speed. And so that's something I changed. And so I think, understanding that speed requires working differently. And if you cannot articulate how you're working differently, then most likely you're doing speed only by brute force and that is not sustainable. So those would just be two things uh, that I would think about to move forward. Julie, thank you so much for taking time to share your incredible story. As I said, I've known you for years, watched you as a leader. And what I really admire so much is that you are a great communicator. You're a great influencer of change, but people can connect with you. They hear you, they engage with you. And I know that a lot of individuals at Accenture certainly know who Julie Sweet is and that you're changing with the times as well. And so a model for others. So thank you for being this incredible leader. And I think one of these days, it won't be about 44 women. <laughs> we'll have much more equality at the top, but you're, you're leading the charge here. So thank you so much for taking your time today and for all the words and wisdom that you've given us. Well, Janice, thanks for having me today. And thank you for all your support of Accenture. And thank you to our audience for tuning in to another game-changing conversation on Leadership Reimagined. You can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, or visit our website at ellagroup.com. Thank you for joining us today.